For that reason, investors are back in Liberia. We are especially proud that through this lecture series, we have the opportunity to link and bring together great leaders, a great university, and a great, universe, and great institution together. Thank you, and thank you very much, Madam President, to be in Houston and start this lecture series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. Now it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to the president of Rice University, David Liebren, who will introduce our eminent speaker. President Liebren is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. He served as the dean of Columbia University's Law School and became the seventh president of Rice University in 2004. He is also a great supporter of our Baker Institute. So please join me in welcoming David Liebren to the podium. Good evening and welcome to Rice University and the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy. Before introducing our extraordinary guests, I do want to add my thanks to the Baker Institute and its founding director, Ambassador Ed Jerigian, for hosting this event. The Baker Institute has been the leading edge in making our university the global institution that it has become. It is increasingly recognized nationally and internationally as a preeminent public policy institute, as evidenced, among other things, by the renowned speakers that it continues to attract. We are also extremely thankful to Chevron for its sponsorship of this evening's lecture. As you have heard, the Chevron Excellence in Leadership Energy Lecture Series is the Baker Institute Energy Forum's flagship energy speakers program. We have built an increasingly broad relationship with Chevron, which is a partner with Rice in our missions of education, research, and service. And we're very grateful for Chevron's vision in forging its partnership with Rice. President Sirleaf is an especially appropriate speaker for this series as she has, among other things, been focused on the energy needs and opportunities of our, her country since she took office. And in the last few months, of course, we have seen Liberia emerge as potentially a new oil exporter and power. We are indeed honored to have with us a remarkable leader of social, economic, and political change. Educated both in Liberia and in the United States, President Sirleaf's life and career has frequently led her away from her home country, but she has always returned to Liberia and had a deep and enduring impact on her nation and her people, contributing to the range, evolution of policies across a range of issues, including, importantly, the role and rights of women. Because of her efforts, President Sirleaf was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2011. She received this award jointly with two other women for, quote, their nonviolent struggle for safety of women and for women's rights for full participation in peace building work. Twice imprisoned and in danger of losing her life during a more than 30 year political career, President Sirleaf's journey to Oslo and to the presidency was fraught with serious dangers and challenges. In Liberia's civil war, as in many conflagrations, women and children were especially vulnerable and subject to war crimes and trafficking by warring factions led by warlords and other paramilitary organizations. It was a movement made up primarily of women, both Christian and Muslim, that in many ways brought Liberia's civil war to an end. President Sirleaf's compatriot and fellow Nobel laureate, Lema Gaboe, led Liberia's women to resist and stand down the forces of violence and destruction. The first woman to be elected head of state of a modern African nation, President Sirleaf took the reins of Africa's oldest republic in 2006, while it was still recovering from 14 years of devastating civil war. 
It was in the context of rebuilding after years of violence that President Sirleaf has not only been a role model for women across the African continent, but also an inspiration for leaders around the world. As president, she has pursued an ambitious agenda. During her six-year term, so for her first six-year term, President Sirleaf addressed the priorities of stamping out corruption, bringing adequate electricity to the capital city of Monrovia, and providing opportunities for the 100,000 people who had recently laid down weapons after years of armed struggle. In her six years as president, her administration announced that elementary education would be both compulsory and free, vigorously fought corruption, passed a Freedom of Information Bill, the first of its kind in Western Africa, and nearly eliminated Liberia's external debt. In short, she has put Liberia on the path to a more prosperous and democratic future. With the recent discovery of potentially large oil reserves off the coast of Liberia, President Surley faces the new challenges of assuring that the wealth is used to further the welfare of the Liberian people and the progress of her nation. That has not always been the case in developing countries, and so once more, all eyes are on Liberia to set a new example. President Sirleaf has been recognized with numerous awards, including 14 honorary degrees from American colleges and universities. In 2010, Newsweek magazine listed President Sirleaf as one of the 10 best leaders in the world. Time placed her among the top 10 female leaders, and The Economist called her the best president the country has ever had. In her Nobel lecture in Oslo last October, President Sirleaf said, history will judge us not by what we say in this moment in time, but by what we do next to lift the lives of our countrymen and women. It will judge us by the legacy we leave behind for generations to come. President Sirleaf's leadership has indeed begun to build that legacy. Please join me in warmly welcoming Her Excellence Ellen, Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, President of Liberia and 2011 Nobel Peace Prize Laureate. President Lebron, faculty, students of Rice University, Mr. James Cronover, Chairman of the Rice Advisory Board, Ambassador Dergen, the Baker Institute Founding Director, Mr. Ali Majuri, President of Chevron Africa and Latin America Exploration and Production Company, our other partners in the oil industry state and local leaders, citizens of Houston and Texas, members of the Diplomatic and Consular Co, distinguished guests and executives. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first introduce to you three members of our delegation since they form an important part of the reform and the measures will be taken. The President of, our, of the Liberian Senate, Mr. Bessinger Finley, the Deputy Speaker of our House of Representatives, and our Minister of Information, Culture, and Tourism. I bring you greetings from the government and people of Liberia. And on behalf of my delegation, thank you for the warm hospitality extended to us. We look forward to welcoming all of you, if only to experience the reciprocal warmth of the Liberian people. Let me thank Secretary James Baker for this invitation to visit with you, his colleagues, at this Institute of Public Policy, deservedly named in his honor. 
I feel honored to inaugurate the Chevron Excellence in Energy Leadership Lecture Series. As our global dependence on fossil fuels grows, I believe the time is upon us to bring bold leadership to policymaking, innovation, and best practices in resolving the energy challenges of the world. Especially in this regard, I foresee that the reputation of this lecture series will continue to grow, as has the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy. Importantly also, the historic significance of Rice University is not lost on us. This year, Rice proudly celebrates its centenary. I wish the faculty and students a well-deserved celebration and need not remind you of the challenge you face in continuing the distinguished tradition of providing academic excellence and in leading the global search for answers to the many difficult questions with which our world is confronted. The backdrop of Texas also bears significance for Liberia. We share the Lone Star. While Texas is referred to as the Lone Star State, Liberia is known as the Lone Star Republic. <laughs> also, many Liberians recall with profound gratitude that 10 years ago, as our country burned in the fire of its own destruction, a man from Texas, President George W. Bush, stood by us and brought the enormous influence of the United States to bear upon the resolution of the Liberian tragedy. The Bush administration laid out a roadmap which enabled Liberia's peace security, and emerging democracy. And so today, here we stand, grateful for the many sacrifices that brought us here, proud of what Liberians have achieved, and keenly aware of the difficult roads we must still travel to nation building. It seems appropriate, therefore, that this inaugural lecture will focus on the integration of energy, peace, and security, and that it is taking place in Houston, Texas, the energy capital of the world. I have come to Houston to listen and to learn, to engage with you in a dialogue that will enable our global search for answers to important questions, and especially for Liberia, to make all work for all Liberians. At a time when Liberia is commencing our journey into the complexity of the petroleum industry, when oil is expected to create wealth, when for many developing countries, especially in Africa, the exploration of oil is yet to address or resolve the issues of poverty and its latent threats to peace and security, when rather than bridging socioeconomic gaps are being, widened, gapping, are being widened by exclusionary and unaccountable management of oil revenues, giving rise to the notion of oil being a resource curse as opposed to an economic kill. For Liberia then, this conversation could not have come at a better time. Ours is a nascent process of exploration and exploitation. As anyone can imagine, the expectations of Liberians are high. The learning curve of our administration is steep. Notwithstanding, we intend, we are committed to getting it right. For the long-term peace and security of Liberia, we must get it right. This is why we embrace the developing partnership with Chevron to inform the growth of Liberia's petroleum sector and to develop and implement programs and policies intended to justly and equitably 
account for this natural resource so as to facilitate our objective of lifting Liberians. This is a continuation of our national journey of sustainable peace, security, and economic development. Liberia is painfully aware that resources become a curse when rather than minimizing, they are used to maximize social inequities and inequalities. And rather than bring a nation closer together, they further divide and exclude. We have lived with this unfortunate experience. It stands out as one of the greatest paradox of our history. Blessed as we are with natural resources and a small population, Liberia has remained grossly underdeveloped. Its natural resources obviously mismanaged, and the majority of our people have lived in poverty. Through structural, adjust, through structural and institutional reforms, and an unmatched commitment to openness, inclusiveness, freedoms, and accountability, our administration is determined to stop this trend. Hopefully, we are on track to end the nightmare and to establish enduring frameworks through which the natural resources of Liberia will lift many, and not only a few Liberians, permitting us to be inextricably bound to the common purpose of our nation. We will continue to provide increased opportunities for Liberians to build their capacity, to provide for their self-fulfillment, to assume personal responsibility for their advancements, to, en to enliven their entrepreneurial spirits, and to develop their communities. Through these efforts, we fulfill our ambition to lift many Liberians out of poverty into the middle class. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as in Liberia, peace and security around the same issues of poverty, exclusion, and bad government practices. Our continent, Africa, has undertaken enormous strides to correct these ills. There can be little doubt that the roots of democracy, individual freedoms, protection of rights and good governance are deepening beneath the topsoil of African societies. Whereas 10 years ago, at least a dozen countries in Africa were experiencing some form of armed conflict, today the number is fewer than four. In West Africa, ECOWAS, our sub-regional organization, has acted quickly and decisively to reverse a military coup in Mali, confirming the region's zero tolerance for undemocratic interventions across West Africa and on the continent. Senegal, another ECOWAS member, trumpeted a new wave of peaceful transition of power with which the region and its people have been proudly engaged. These developments testify to the increased sense of stability in Africa and renew our faith in the commitment we share to make Liberia, to make Africa a sense of stability, to ensure that our continent increasingly is attractive for trade and foreign capital investment. At the same time, we must explore avenues to build indigenous capacity on whose shoulders and entrepreneurial spirits such trades and investment can be sustained and over time be beneficial to the African people. In Liberia, we seek for an investment in the exploitation of our many natural resources. We know we must continue to keep our country stable and we must continue to build upon our hard-earned peace. This is why our administration will continue the course of openness accountability, reconciliation, and inclusiveness in the governance of our country. Working with experienced partners like Chevron and others are calling from a pool of available best practices. We are seeking to put into place the necessary policies, programs, and laws that are attractive to investors, and more importantly, fair to Liberia. 
six years ago, we inherited the reins of a country saddled by divisions, ruined by conflicts, and unsure of its future. Our task, difficult as you can imagine, was to inspire a doubtful nation to believe again, to look beyond the ashes and the ruins, beyond the deaths and destruction, and to believe in a future of peace, security, and prosperity. Our mission was to lift Liberia, a country which was once revered for its many contributions to world affairs, good neighborliness, and the search for international peace and security. Today, six years later, we are proud and emboldened by our achievement to declare that Liberia is back. Although we have some ways to go, we are experiencing a wonderful transformation. Doubts have given way to hope. Divisions to inclusion. Previous suppressions of freedom and rights to the advance of individual freedoms and civil liberties. Incapacities to capacity building. And the struggle for daily survival is being steadily replaced by a long-term disposition toward the future. Difficult conversations and taboos are being slowly ushered into an increasingly fertile marketplace of ideas. Ever so slowly, the previously weakened and discredited political system within which is subsumed the economic and social systems of our country is being strengthened by much needed reforms and nurtured by our flagship programs and policies of openness and decentralization. These achievements have made our people more anxious for more. They have become rightfully expectant. Our re-election to a second six-year term is a critical milestone. With that re-election, our commitment to and progress in peace, governance, and democracy have passed the test. The challenge with which we are currently faced is to translate our macroeconomic advances into changes that will possibly, positively affect the lives of our people. Having successfully lifted Liberia, we must enduringly lift Liberians. Here especially, we need to focus on our youthful population, many of whom were victimized by the prolongation of the conflict and are becoming mothers and fathers without the required education, skills, or the benefit of formal training to provide for themselves and their families. This challenge cannot afford to wait. We must meet it head on. Our natural resources, among other things, must enable this fight in the last six years, Liberia has attracted over 16 billion in foreign capital investment. Direct foreign participation has returned to Liberia as investors seek opportunities in mining, agriculture, infrastructure, aviation, renewable energies, and more recently, offshore oil exploration. And so we have come to Houston to examine the many dimensions and complexities of, inv of inviting oil into our economy. How do we weave this powerful and volatile resource into our upward ascent and transformation? How do we situate oil in our avowed mission of economic and social justice? How can oil strengthen rather than weaken our peace and security? Above all, how do we make all work for all Liberians? Thinking deeply in the search for answers, recently a hydrocarbon technical committee completed a four-day retreat where representatives from our ministries of justice and others, along with other international partners and a number of civil society organizations, sketched 
the outlines of a policy framework for the sector. I expect that these frameworks will be hammered into proposed legislation for consideration by our legislature. The policy framework which is being developed considers several critical issues. One, adjusting and resolving a potential conflict of interest in our oil company NoCal, serving both as industry regulator and an equity partner. Two, updating the current petroleum law to, to establish a clear and reliable legal and regulatory framework and a fair share of potential oil revenues for the country. Three, improving indigenous capacities to enable a level playing field with our partners. Four, setting new and higher standards of transparency and accountability for oil and gas. And finally, advancing the cause of corporate social responsibility by which the local population benefits from the exploitation of resources from their backyards. All of these are intended to address what matters most to Liberians, which is that the proper mechanisms are put into place to create deep and lasting partnerships with investors on the one hand, while on the other, ensuring that Liberia's economic growth and development are irreversible in its equitable spread of opportunity and benefits to all Liberians. My dear friends, oil may seem like a recent addition to our array of resources, but the story of oil in Liberia actually started as early as 1948 and ended in 1972. Chevron, in a way, has come back as it was one of the three companies, including Union Carbide Petroleum and Frontier International Petroleum, which drilled wells from 1970 and 1972. Between 1983 and 1989, three wells were drilled by Amoco Liberia Exploration Company. Although all of the wells proved the presence of hydrocarbons, technological limitations, along with the low price of oil at the time, resulted in an abandonment of the exploration initiative. In 2006, we inherited a loosely defined national oil company created in the year 2000, together with the 2002 petroleum law, which seemed to be designed for the frontier state situation. 17 offshore blocks were demarcated. A first bid round in 2004 had awarded contracts for eight of these blocks and generated production sharing conflicts with varying terms, provisions, and benefits. Today, we have improved the capacities of NoCal and we are determined to attract and to work with world-class partners to Liberia to create strong and lasting partnerships where the private sector and the entrepreneurial spirits of Liberians will drive the national engine of economic growth and development. I'm pleased that Chevron is one of those partners. Unsurprisingly, the recent announcement of the discovery of oil off our coast has created a new sense of urgency in Liberia. Public interest has ballooned and we welcome the increased engagement and scrutiny. Naturally, expectations are high, even as we know that oil may not be drilled in the period of our administration. Yet it is our duty to move with equal urgency to manage these expectations and to work with our partners to put into place the right framework and exploitation of Liberia's oil in a transparently management for both current and future generations. We seek in our identification of the areas of our priority to reform the existing oil policies and legislation to bring them in line with international be best practice, increase accountability, transparency, fairness, and, equity and equality in a manner that includes and informs and educates our citizens, to strengthen our partnership with the world's best, best operators, and to manage our revenues in such a manner that all will be proud of what we have done. We know 
that oil is important to our economy, but oil is not all of our economy. Our commitment is to use our natural resources, that which we have in so many other areas, to ensure that those resources are allocated efficiently, that the use of those resources are meant to meet the needs of the majority of our people, to build partnerships on the basis of mutual respect and mutual benefits, to enable Liberia to become a very vibrant partner in our promotion of regional cooperation and integration, and to become internationally a country that indeed can be said to be a post-conflict success story. We thank you for all that you've done to make a contribution to this achievement. Uh, how has the dialogue surrounding women's property rights in Africa evolved over the course of your time in government and your long experience? And to what extent do you believe this contributes to the broader conversation on female empowerment? Well, as you know, there's been um, unequal opportunity <laughs> in equities as far as women are concerned. And this is, this is traditional, and this is also global. But there have been great improvement in the past few years, improvement in terms of women access women's access to the factors of production, and as a result of that, women's empowerment have been put on the right track. And so today, I don't think women feel uh, unequal. I think they feel that they can, they can, they can compete and can, can reach their own potential as any other. Yes, there still remains constraints as we break down all the traditional barriers, right. uh, but uh, I'm convinced that um, it won't take very long when, when all those remaining, those lingering constraints will be removed because uh, uh, the, the doors are open <coughs> for equal opportunity. Excellent. I'm sorry, so how can Liberians in the United States contribute to rebuilding your country? In a way, they're already contributing. Through remittances, uh, Liberians abroad have been supporting Liberia's effort. Uh, but they can go beyond that, they can come home. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good answer. <laughs> what needs to happen to get other African nations to follow your, your truly brave leadership in promoting economic and social development? You know, that's happening in many other countries. Liberia is not unique in that regard. Uh, in many respects, we have some catch-up to do also. Mm. You know, quite a few African countries have made great better strides than we have. Uh, but we're glad we're on the right track, and I think to a certain extent, uh, maybe because, uh, because, you know, being the only woman, and thank God there are two now in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can be, we can set an example and become a model, but uh, I think you find that uh, many African countries are now on the right track, having the right sound economic policies, uh, good governance, making sure that there's uh, efficiency in resource allocation. A few are behind, but quite a few have, uh, have made it. And so we we'll, we'll just feel that Africa's time has come. That's going to be a lot of good things happening. Some have suggested a scholarship fund as part of a contracts between oil companies and host governments instead of a straight royalty uh, to the government to improve the country's human capital. What are, what are your thoughts on this idea? As I said, we've embarked upon a reform process that will enable us to look at best practices all over. Uh, once we've got all that information, we'll be able to see exactly you know, what are the proper laws, what are the policies, what are the, the governance and the regulatory structures that should be adopted based upon our own country specificity, of course.
but one that will enable us to, to put it right. So I, I, I don't have a prejudgment on, you know, what's the back, best way to do it. We do know that capacity building is gonna be at the cornerstone of whatever we do, because we need to make sure that we have people, uh, uh, Liberians, who can, who can manage this resource in a manner in which they can be equal partners uh, to those who are coming to, to, to join us in that. So we're, we're, we're gonna try and just do it right by making sure we adapt those things that are those countries that have done it right and who have successfully managed their resources for the better good of the country, so. Madam President, could you elaborate on what your plans are to do exactly that in terms of capacity enhancement and what you plan to do in the educational system in Liberia? To train more Liberians, particularly in those fields where we've been lacking, engineering, the sciences, those technical fields where we have a major capacity gap. Uh, today we have a program working with our partners in all of the, um, the, the sectors, uh, the exploitative sectors, what is mining or what is oil. We have, a, we have a program in which the support for the training of Liberians, both at home and abroad, are in place. It's not big enough, it needs to be expanded, it needs to be intensified, the numbers need to be greater. More importantly, it's not just a matter of sending our people out for training in technical fields, but building the technical institutions at home that will enable a greater number of our citizens to take advantage of the skills training. So those are the things we'll be working on. And I take it that the exchange programs and Liberian students studying in countries like the United States are part of that overall effort? Yes, they are. We have quite a few of those that's going going. Underpricing of oil and other natural resources has contributed to unsustainable production and consumption of these resources. We recently saw riots in Nigeria protesting the rising gasoline prices. What is your administration's policy toward <laughs> natural resource pricing? We try to adhere to the principles of proper commercial pricing. Um, we try to make sure that our pricing not only reflect the cost of, of the capital and all of that, but at the same time that is competitive. Uh, when compared in the region, which means that we don't have excessive pressing through, through taxes or kinds of levies, you know, that would cost the pricing. But at the same time, we don't believe in, in, in subsidies because if you do that, mm -hmm. then they're not sustainable. Right. So we try to find a, bit, uh, a right balance, and I think we've been able to, to get it far and large, far and largely right. The, the, um, the changes in global prices, uh, we have a formula that takes that into account and try to keep our operational costs down so that uh, we can't stay within, within that particular sliding mechanism. No. Okay. Um, but so far, I think we've been able to get it right. Excellent. Uh, the, uh, how would you characterize U.S.-Liberian relations? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> would you wish to elaborate? <laughs> no, it, it really is. Um, we have strong bipartisan support. Uh, we've been able, I, you might say that in those early days when we started off in 2006 and our resources were so scarce and our capacity so weak that um, the U.S. was our number one partner and they came in and since that time we've enjoyed uh, uh, budgetary support from the U.S. and they've been, you know, the thing, they've helped to retrain a new army. So, uh, and from that time, Things have just, they've just been, we've been one of the, the major recipients. Without that strong U.S. support, we probably would not have made the progress that we have made to date. And so it's, it's been, I mean, we're getting to the place now where I think they feel we're, we're, reading the, we're reaching the graduation point. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can see a bit, of a, a bit of a decline now as if to say, okay, you know, you're coming up to be on your own, but uh, I'm gonna go back to remind them that, you know, we've, <laughs> we'll reach the crossroads, you know, you, you can't draw back right now. We've got, we got one more step to climb. 
<laughs> uh, Madam President, when do you think we in the United States will elect a woman president? <laughs> <laughs> Courage. <laughs> it's got to come, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much, madam. <laughs>